This is John Strong. You're listening to Soccer Made in Portland. Opinions, yes. Factual information that remains to be seen. That's never stopped uh, us before. You know, I haven't spent a lot of time uh, with Merritt Paulson in, in my life, but it was definitely the happiest I think I've ever seen him. I am awesome. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Soccer Made in Portland. It is February 28th, Tuesday, February 28th, in fact. And I think everybody got the chance last night to see the Timbers play in person, uh, or at least in Portland, if you were watching on the web stream. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, But to start with, this is Mao speaking, of course, uh, as you know, and Kelly McLean of Timbers Insider fame is... Uh, next to me on the screen. Uh, Kelly, good morning. And uh, how late were you up writing last night? Eesh, later than I should have been. I, I was very rusty at you know, doing the whole match report deal and getting that going. So I finally got to bed about one. Ooh, ooh that's even worse than me. So I'm. It wasn't pretty. Yeah, I, I'm sure you noticed I conveniently didn't go down to the uh, press conference afterwards. Um, I had to do my write-up for the first game of the evening. I got that done. Uh, I was done about 11.30, so I'm in better shape than you then. That's good. Uh, Quickly, let me just run through the particulars of of how to get in touch and and where you can find us, and then we'll spend the rest of the time uh, just simply talking about the Timbers. Um, The the best way to find us is, of course, at nasn.tv. That's the North American Soccer Network. Uh, all kinds of new shows always coming up there. Uh, you are probably familiar with Yanks Abroad uh, and their fantastic efforts, and they uh, have just announced that they will also be joining uh, joining us and many others on NASN, so we're happy to hear that. Uh, so you can check that out and check us out at the website. Our, uh, our archive shows are there. Uh, you can find links to iTunes and, and RSS feeds from there. Of course, we're on Twitter as well. We usually uh, you know, send out some information about when we'll be on, who our guests might be, uh, those kinds of things, and that's at Soccer Made in PDX. And you can send us direct emails, as at least one listener did this week, uh, soccer.portland at gmail.com. And uh, we, you know, you're always welcome to send in anything there. And uh, given that this is February 28th, I figure we should go back and look at what else happened on this day in Timbers history. Uh, nothing too, too significant. Um, Timbers forward Mike Flater re signed with the Timbers in 1979 on this date. Uh, he'd been an important part of the, the 1978 team, second in the team in, in scoring with seven goals, uh, and the team that reached the NASL semifinals. Uh, he had kind of an injury plague career, so that actually didn't end up working out too well in the long run, but that happened today in 1979. And in this date last year, um, maybe with a little bit of overlap with, with this week's show, the Timbers announced that they would be playing in the U.S. Open Cup qualifier uh, match against Chivas USA. And, of course, that match was later played in March uh, at Merlot Field. But uh, February 28th, 2011, the Timbers made that announcement about Chivas. And, and we'll be talking a little bit about them towards the end of the show, just as by way of preview. Uh, what, what do you want to do to start? Do you want to just go through a little bit of news first, or do you want to jump straight in with the, the game from last night? Yeah, let's let's cover a few news items because I'm sure once we get start start talking about uh, the game and and even the OSU scrimmage a little bit, I'm I'm sure we'll get carried away and have plenty to talk about. So uh, yeah, let's hit some of the news items. You know, they signed Joe Bendick, uh, the young goalkeeper, 22 years old. Uh, he's coming from Norway. He spent a couple couple years there um, with Songdal. And sounded as though he got a, a handful of starts um, while he was there. Um, but I think I'd read somewhere that they had a, a goalkeeper that perhaps was injured and then came back from injury. And so it sort of looked like he was going to get pushed to the side again. Um, but seems like a, a good product. I know we heard, uh, I- at least while the team was in California and those preseason matches down there, that in a couple of those games, it sounded like he had some nice performances. So, seems as though uh, probably a good a good signing for that third goalkeeper spot. 
Yeah, that's something that we'd, we'd spend a significant amount of time talking about, or, or at least had mentioned on a significant number of occasions. Uh, you know, just wondering what the Timbers were going to do about that position, given Jake Gleason's uh, impending absence uh, with New Zealand and, and their Olympic hopeful uh, or Olympic hopes in the tournament coming up. And so, yeah, this this kid seems, you know, he's actually, I think, a year older than Jake or, or roughly the same age, but uh, has has a little bit of professional experience, uh, was quite a good collegiate player. He played down at Clemson in South Carolina, and I think he was, you know, all-conference in the ACC a couple of times and uh, pretty pretty um, highly rated at, at that point. So, uh, and, and then we, you know, you and I talked to Mike Toshak. Uh, it's been about a month now, but, before the team went to California and, and uh, just kind of asked him what he thought about being in Portland and what he thought about the, some of the new guys. And uh, he spoke pretty highly of Bendik and said, you know, he's sort of we're still rounding into to, to match condition and he seems to be there now. So uh, it seems to be the perfect signing uh, for what the Timbers need, a guy who's not going to make a lot of money, uh, but, you know, could be used if, if necessary, given injuries or, or something else. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And uh, I'm wondering if we, uh, I, I, I doubt we're going to see him in this, this tournament this week. I mean, what, what do you think? Don't you think Jake will probably play Thursday and Troy again on Sunday maybe? I, I would assume so. I mean, obviously, we're probably not going to see a, a ton from him, although we do expect that he would be in the 18 at, at some point because we know Jake is, is likely to be gone uh, for at least a handful of matches. But obviously, we, we don't expect to to actually see him much other than perhaps uh, some reserve league games maybe and that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another little bit of news. I think most people know that Frank Songo was not in town last night. Uh, he's in fact not even in the country, uh, at least as far as I know. I, I don't think he's back yet. And um, he is there securing a visa. I guess whatever visa he had to be here in the first place uh, was, was a pretty short-term deal given – uh, his status as just a trialist when he first came in, and and now he's going to need something a little more uh, permanent, or or not permanent, but you know longer lasting. So uh, he's yeah he's gone this week, and um, you know that we'll talk more about that in terms of on field, uh, but off you know, off the field, you know he he has this injury, uh, and you know I'm not necessarily sure the timing was the best to to make uh, multiple transatlantic flights uh with that kind of injury but you you know it's more important that he get that visa than basically i mean at this point almost anything else for the timbers um so he he will be absent i would assume this entire week unless something dramatic changes and he's able to get back before sunday's game but uh i think we may still be waiting to hear on that for a little while yeah, and I suppose if he's going to get injured, I mean, it's not great that he's traveling so much, but if he was going to be gone anyway, uh, if you're going to have an, a nick that needs, that needs a week off, I suppose this is the, the week to take it. Um, also, you know, we've still got these two roster spots left. Um, both uh, Gavin and, and Spencer have alluded to uh, Sebastian Rincon a couple of times basically saying that they're, they're trying to get him signed. And I imagine they're trying to work out the details. But Ryan Kowalik is, is sort of the last piece and kind of waiting to see if they're going to sign him. Uh, you pointed out that the jersey he wore last night had his name on it. And would they really do that if they weren't going to sign him? I mean, it, it certainly appears as though they're pretty high on him and they like him and uh, I think is will talk about ad nauseum later i'm sure I, I thought he he did a pretty decent job last night certainly made a case for himself uh that that they might want to secure him and and uh bring him on in that in that final spot um yeah i mean for a team that didn't fill out the roster last year i, I think there's no real reason and unless unless there's a financial reason that we don't know about. And, and if they sign Ryan Kowalik, it isn't going to be for big money. So that I, I can't imagine. There, in fact, he shouldn't even count against the cap because he should be in that right. 25 to 30 range. But uh, there is a allocation money for teams that don't use two spots. Um, I think there's 35K to each spot that they don't use. For interesting. Two okay. Well, I mean, it's... Yeah, well, let's talk about that for a second because, 
even without necessarily getting into the details of last night, the Timbers only have, we've talked about this before too, uh, you know, they only have two guys who really can play right back, uh, you know, even close to, to MLS level. Uh, one is Lavelle Palmer, who's getting over uh, an injury, I guess a hamstring injury, and played a little bit last night, I think about 12 or 15 minutes at the end of the game. The other is Steve Purdy, who is is currently in Los Angeles with El Salvador's national team. Uh, he doesn't really seem to be in favor, or at least wasn't for most of last year. So I, I think having a guy, you know, having a guy who actually can play the position and, and seems to be, I, I don't know if it's his natural position or not, but it, but it definitely seems he's capable of playing at right back. Mm-hmm. T- to have a guy who actually is a right back play in the, as a right back in the reserves I think is a important thing for the Timbers. I mean, one of the issues they had last year was guys who needed to be in the starting lineup or needed to be available as substitutes also having to play in the reserves simply because of a lack of bodies. And they had different guys at different positions where where, where it wasn't their position. I mean, Freddie Braun played a lot of uh, right back last year. And, and, you know, that's not really necessarily that great for his development as a midfielder if if you want Freddie Braun to be part of your longer term uh, plan. So to have guys who, to play in their natural positions or close enough, um, you know, in that reserve team, it, I, I think it's pretty important. It, it allows guys to actually benefit and, and take advantage of the opportunity that 10 games in the reserves affords uh, instead of just feeling like they're constantly plugging gaps. So I, I think, I mean, I, I really just don't think they'd put his name on a shirt. I mean, he was on the video last night uh, that the, the, or I guess they put it out this morning, but the club's video from the website where they, you know, showed a little bit of John Spencer's press conference. They showed a little bit of uh, questioning of Jack Jewsbury, and then they they spoke to Kowalik at the end. I just don't think that's the kind of thing that they would do with a random, uh, or even n- unrandom. I mean, he obviously was in the U23s, but uh, with a guy who they weren't necessarily sure about, you just don't feature guys like that on your website. Um, unless there's something else going on. At least that's that's my opinion. Yeah, you know, I asked them, I, I, I guess I'll have to plead a, a bit of ig- ignorance here, and maybe I, sh- I should know, but I, I was under the impression that he was more of a center back. And so I specifically asked him about playing right back, and he said that, I, I mean, I forget. It's, it, it was a long night, and, mm-hmm. and I haven't re-listened to it. But he, if memory serves, he said that he has played plenty of right back in the past. So I don't know if in college, if he did that, if he split time there. I was under the impression that he was primarily a center back in college. But maybe I'm wrong on that. But he, when I asked him about it, he said, yeah, no problem. I'm I'm comfortable there. He, I, as I recall, he said he played, he's played significantly at right outside back. Um, and so he he seems like if that's the case, that he might be that that person like you're talking about, perhaps like uh, Chris Taylor on the left. You know, that young guy that has actually played there a bunch, and you you put him in the reserves and get him a bunch of time, and and he can develop. Um, at that position, because as we've talked about before, that's that's definitely something that that they need. Yeah, and I, I I'm I'd be more than happy to to have him signed uh, and and added to the team because it's it's another instance of a guy coming through the U23 program. It's another guy who, while I'm sure he was nervous last night and going out there even just for preseason, um, you know, in in front of sixteen thousand plus. He's a guy who's played in that stadium before. He's played for Jim Rylett before. He is familiar with the club. He's familiar with the city. He's obviously from, you know, or is in school around here. So I guess at UP. So uh, those are the kinds of guys that, you know, the, the future Timbers, you know, 10, 12, 15 years from now, uh, when, when we're, you know, still doing this podcast, uh, <laughs> th- those are the kinds of guys that, you know, or the future of the club. They're, they're, they're local kids. They're, they're, they're kids that come through the system. Uh, and even though the system is a bit fragmented now, you know, getting kids like him and Richards and, and Braun and Gleason, uh, th- you know, the, getting those guys through, it, I think is an important sort of bridge between, uh, you know, what, 
was definitely fully professional in, in the second division, but not in the same way that MLS clubs, you know, modern MLS clubs operate. Uh, so to bridge that gap with kids who have that familiarity, I think is important. Um, well, let's let's get into the game. Yeah, uh, be, because it, that was definitely the dominant uh, storyline from yesterday, and. Uh, you know, most, I'm sure most people who are going to listen to this either were there or were watching uh, the, the live stream. But nevertheless, we're going to talk about it as if you weren't there. <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's break it down. Well, okay, let's just talk about the game in general. And then let's break it down sort of by position uh, or sort of, uh, you know, general position and, and sort of see what we thought about how guys played, how they played together, how they played in different formations. In general, I, I think the Timbers were okay uh, on the night. I, I think they were, there were definitely some really nice things that, that they did uh, in different places. There were some things that um, I think were good and, and not necessarily surprising, but but nice to see. On the other hand, there were some things that weren't quite as nice to see and some unfriendly reminders of some of the things that were uh, struggles or difficulties in, in 2011 that, you know, simply going through the offseason doesn't necessarily magically change. And uh, I think in the end, the Timbers probably deserve to win the game, um, but the the mistake that that led to the own goal surely deserve to be punished in, in some way. I, I don't know if, if, if it was through an own goal, but, but John Baptiste horrendous pass, uh, uh, you know, wh- whatever that was out of the back, um, you know, that directly led to, to the, the goal that Mascara clipped in. Uh, it was a pretty nice goal from Mascara actually, you know, if, if the, <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> it had Perkins fooled. That's for sure. Um, yes. so, uh, you know, and then there's also the, the sort of the the storyline that was played up in in the newspapers, which was that this was a super aggressive game and that the Timbers were out fighting for their teammates and things and I, and I understand a little bit of that because of the 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 brouhaha that happened last year with uh, Mike Chabala calling out his teammates in the press saying that he was disappointed that nobody came to his defense and this time Jack Jewsbury got kind of. I don't know. He sort of seemed to create his own issue on that particular instance with with Sam Cronin. But Sam Cronin was was definitely doing some some dirty things out there, and uh, not just against Jack Jewsbury. And when Jewsbury got in a little bit of a, a shoving match, I think Stephen Lenhart was the first one there, which is not a surprise. And then the whole Timbers team basically uh, was there in the middle, and I, I'm sure that was in response to to that stuff from last year. But I think the the storyline that it, it was a little bit overblown about the aggressiveness considering every game the Timbers played against San Jose was exactly like this last year. Uh, so it should have been no surprise that San Jose would be very physical and, and trying to disrupt, uh, the, the Timbers, you know, much more fluid and interesting style relative to, to San Jose. So, uh, let's start there. What, what were your general thoughts on, uh, on what we saw last night? Well, I'd have to agree. I, I thought the aggressiveness was was overplayed, and I mean, we can kind of, I imagine, talk a bit more about that later on, as well. Um, I honestly, it's about what I expected, knowing the players that were not going to be there, whether it was international duty or injuries or whatnot. I, I mean, that's about what I would have expected for a preseason match with, with the guys missing that were missing. Um, like Pretty much like everybody said, there was some good stuff and some stuff that was not so good. But in terms of a preseason game, missing the guys that were missing, I, I think that was a pretty much to be expected. It is rather unfortunate that they gave up the own goal Instead of, you know, when they appeared to be pretty well on their way to keeping a clean sheet, um, San Jose didn't create a ton of, of great opportunities. So that's definitely a disappointment. But I don't know that I'm, I'm sh- shocked at the, at the final result or anything. That's about what I would have expected, I think. Well, let, let's start on the back line then. Uh, well, we can start with Perkins if you want. I thought Perkins played 
a pretty good game. I, I thought there were a, the, the few chances, uh, apart from Mascara kind of schooling him at uh, you know with that sliding goal. Otherwise, he he was he was good. He he had some nice reaction saves. Uh, there were a couple of times. Uh, Linhart had one in particular uh, that kind of rifled up from from uh, right off the turf, and, and Perkins made a nice save there. He had a couple diving saves in other instances, and uh, with balls in the air, a few times he you know was able to snag them right before you know heads came in to to try and poke the ball in. So I, I thought on on the whole he he was completely fine. And um, really, not to blame at all for the for the goal. Yeah, the, I, I have I have a feeling we're probably going to say the same thing over and over again all year about Perkins, which is he was just solid. And every once in a while, he's going to come up with a spectacular save to to save the team's butt. Um, but obviously, yeah, we're going to have very few complaints about Perkins. Yeah, he, he that's one of the the. The, the positions where I feel most assured, uh, I, I'm probably the most assured of, of any position on the field uh, right now. Uh, yeah. On the back line, I, I think is where most people, um, or maybe not most people, certainly people who were tweeting during the game were, were asking some questions of the back line. Um, it, it should obviously be noted who the players were that were playing. Uh, Mike Chabala was the left back, Ryan Kowalik was the right back. Andrew John Baptiste and and Anya Mascara were the center backs. Now Mascara, of course, b- uh, by every account uh, emanating from the club, is a surefire starter, and and you know will will be there on opening day uh, in the starting eleven, and you know uh, maybe he will, maybe he won't. I, I thought he had a pretty good first half. And actually, I thought he and John Baptiste combined pretty well as a center back pairing, considering who they were opposing. Uh, which is Steven Lenhart, who is a crafty, uh, wily, and good forward, and Chris Wondolowski, who is, uh, you know, may not be one of the best players in MLS, but is certainly one of the best goal scorers in MLS. And they did a really nice job of limiting his opportunities. He didn't have all that much uh, to speak of. Uh, one header, I think, off of a corner, which which Perkins easily saved. Um, so I think in the first half, those guys actually did a really nice job despite the, the incessant criticism, which I didn't really understand, uh, on, on Twitter. I mean, nobody should expect that those two guys should be the best center back pairing in MLS. Uh, Jean Baptiste, I think most would have assumed would spend the entire season in the reserves if it weren't for footy being gone, Bruner being hurt and Horst being hurt long-term. So I, I, I'm actually okay with them. The, obviously, as I mentioned, the mistake was bad. Mascara had some more difficulties in the second half than the first. But I think on the whole, they didn't really allow two pretty good forwards to, to get too much going. Uh, Chabala, I thought, was okay. Uh, you thought he struggled in the first half, um, uh, as we kind of talked about last night. But I thought he was at least acceptably good. I mean, uh, he, he wasn't disastrously bad uh, apart from his little, his attempt to kind of trick Marvin Chavez and, and flip a ball back over his head from the in line, which he basically miss hit and went out for a, <laughs> went out for a corner. Uh, so I, and, and as you mentioned, Kowalik, I thought was a nice surprise. I, I thought he got, he got forward really well. He was uh, very actively involved. He had a couple of crosses. He almost uh, got his head on the ball a couple of times from free kicks and, and corners. Um, visibly showed disappointment in, in missing one after Bush came out and claimed it. So I, I thought, all things considered, the back line wasn't that bad. And and I think it's all with the caveat that we know that there's a, it's entirely possible that none of those four guys could be in the starting lineup on the 12th, or maybe Chabala and Mascara are. I think that remains to be seen, but you could easily make the case that the back line could be Wallace, Bruner, Footy, and Palmer. Yeah, I you know, I was pleasantly surprised. I think I was a little nervous. I think I'd sent you something earlier um, saying, I think that exact scenario, if if those three guys are in the back line, I'm a little bit nervous about that. So I, I was pleasantly surprised with with the way they played. You've got to consider that um, Baptiste and Kowalik, this is their, you know, first, I guess, you know, 
professional game. I mean, it's not their first professional game. They've had some other preseason games, but it's certainly the biggest of their, you know, young professional careers to this point in front of that many fans. And Mosquera certainly has some first team experience down in Colombia, but again, it's a little bit different being up here in the stadium with 16,000 fans, particularly when you consider that a few nights earlier, they had played their first game in the stadium with no one there, yeah, no, one. no one at all, empty, uh, and maybe six of us in the press box. So that's going to be, uh, you know, an in, a slightly intimidating scenario to, to come out there in that environment. And I asked uh, Jean Baptiste, and to his credit, he was honest. I asked him, I said, Did you have, you know, some butterflies coming out of the tunnel? And he said, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to lie and try and say that, you know, I was all Mr. Cool or anything. Yeah, I mean, he had some butterflies. There were some nerves there. But boy, if, if, the, if he and those other guys had some nerves, they sure shook them off pretty quickly. And performed, I think, as well as you could have expected them to. Um, you know, you you would have thought that if Bruner was there and he could have been paired with either Mascara or Baptiste, that that would have really been, you know, helpful for them, even if a guy like Kowalik was out on the side or something. But to have all three of those guys, particularly your two center backs, you know, in that new environment, that kind of experience. I think it, it speaks well to the way they performed. And Chabala, as, as we talked about at halftime, my perception was a little bit thrown because I spent the first 15 or 20 minutes or so down on the field getting some pictures. I, I more than anything just noticed some frustration with Chabala. I think it himself that a couple of his passes early on didn't, make it to to his intended target. Um, but I thought after that, defensively and, and the rest of the night, I thought he was he was fine. It was just perhaps where I was standing down on the field and the fact that I might have been trying to get pictures of him at that moment, that those kind of stood out for me in in the first 15 minutes. I, yeah, I thought Chabala was, was fine. I thought he was, was pretty good defensively. He covered uh, for Jean-Baptiste a couple of times. Uh, one time in particular, Lenhart kind of stepped around him, and and you know if 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 Chabala wasn't trailing, you know that's an easy opportunity at least on goal for for Lenhart. But I think it became pretty clear that the Chabala isn't fast enough to play the style that the, that some of the other guys can play. So when when he was out there and and other guys like Nagby and uh, even Kowalik, who's who can can move pretty well, and Al Hassan and and Chara and Alexander, those guys can all fly, and uh, Alexander supri- surprisingly so. He's he's got some wheels, and and Chabala, who I don't think anybody ever thought was fast, is really actually not very fast at all. And yeah. there were a couple of times where there were balls played to him where he couldn't quite get to it, or uh, he was unable to get past the the outside defender uh, on his side to get a cross off on, on some of the few occasions where he really pushed forward. And I think that's something that the Timbers really have to look at because if they want to play in a style, um, it, it wasn't so much um, the style they were playing in the first half, but when they brought Nagby in and they switched to a, a more traditional 4-4-2, it, it was... It was um, it, it left some things to be desired, and not just with, with Chabal. And I don't mean that as a criticism of him. I mean, there, there are limitations to every player, and, and I think most know what they are. But if he's going to be an active participant in the attack, he's going to have to do it a little bit more creatively uh, because he just doesn't have the speed to get to the corner and, and send a cross in. Um, but that's okay. That doesn't have to be his game. Um, uh, it shouldn't be more the game of, of, of sort of the wide midfielder. So let, let's talk about that a little bit and and maybe first with our confusion over what the actual lineup was and then uh it certainly changed uh in the second half in the first half it seemed like well okay so it looked they basically announced it as a 4-3-3 with which diego Ch- Chira as a forward which what which it clearly wasn't 
It definitely wasn't. And it absolutely wasn't including Diego Chara in any kind of forward role. I mean, he was pushing forward as, as he does. And you, know, you could see it from right at the beginning. I mean, he gets taken down in the box. Uh, perhaps should have been a penalty. It's still even hard to tell, even after watching the replays. I can't really tell if he was actually fouled or not. I've got Regardless. some good pictures of it. Oh, you, yeah. Well, I saw, you, I saw your one, and it looked like there's a pretty good case there. Yeah, that, that one, I've got a couple, three or four in a row, and uh, the one r- right before it pretty clearly shows that, I mean, he just got taken down. And but as as some of us were talking uh, at the game, that's I don't think in a preseason game. I mean, it was a minute into the game. Yeah, yeah. I, no matter what happens, I don't think you're really going to get a referee to to give you that penalty. It would have been. It would have had to be even more egregious, uh, yeah. I think, than it was. And uh, but regardless, you know, that was him pushing forward. But he was not playing as as a forward. And what what it really looked like from my perspective, was exactly the same formation the Timbers would run when they would bring James Marceline in last year. And so they, they'd run four across the back, and they'd sit James right in front of the back four. Uh, and then they had four more midfielders ahead of that, with Jewsbury and Chara in the middle. In this case, they had Alexander on the left and Al-Hassan on the right. And then they had Perlaza up front by himself. Now, as is always the case, uh, and, and I think John Strong usually does a pretty nice job of, of describing the, the fluidity of, of these formations, um, but a 4-4-1-4-1 four, four, one, four, one, or a 4-5-1 and a 4-4-3, four, four, can they all, they all, they're sort of the same. I mean, when, when you have the ball and Alexander and Al-Hassan are pushed forward, you could easily say, well, those three guys are playing as forwards, you know, with Perlaza, and then Chara and Jewsbury are playing in support, you know, in the midfield, and, and, and James is sitting back behind them, very, very clearly separate. So, w- whatever it was, it, it actually worked really well. Uh, I think possession wise, I, I think um, creating chances um, in a way that. In the second half, when they changed the formation, to me, everything sort of fell apart a, a little bit, uh, not necessarily game plan wise, but just execution wise. So I, I, I thought Marceline was one of the best players on the night. I, I thought he did exactly what he's supposed to do. You know, he's never going to be the best passer on the team. He's never going to be the most involved offensive player on the team. But if he's breaking plays up, Winning balls, holding possession up, you know, even on the defensive side is something I think is overlooked in, in soccer sometimes, you know, just allowing things to settle down around you and then get rid of the ball. He's pretty comfortable on the ball, actually, uh, and does a better job even than last year of not immediately, you know, having someone take it off him or, or anything like that. So I thought he did well. I think Jewsbury and Chara both benefit greatly by having cover, permanent cover behind them and allowing them to have flexibility to move around. Jewsbury, stayed a lot, mostly in the middle of the park, didn't push too much forward uh, and sort of let Chara do that. But but having cover for Jewsbury in the back is also nice. And then I thought Alexander was okay. He sort of disappeared at times, but he was. I don't think he was bad. And Al-Hassan, I think, had a, a really nice game all the way around. He sort of did his sort of standard issue game. He just did it a little better than usual. And uh, I think that was beneficial. I, I I think most accurately we dis, we would describe it as a four one four one, um, which is primarily because of of Marceline and, and where they position him. And as I've said a bunch of times, I'm a huge Marceline fan, and and I like most of what he does. In particular, that he's a good outlet for defenders to keep possession back there and help them get out of trouble. Um, as you mentioned, as sort of keeping that possession in the defensive end. So I, I thought he did really well last night. I really like him in that spot. And, and I, I know there's going to be some issues about who's going to get that time in the center of midfield. And we've talked about that before. Um, I, I, I hope that we get to see a bit more of Marceline. I don't know who, at whose expense that comes, uh, but I like him in that spot there. Um, I, I don't know that I noticed a ton of, of difference between offensively, possession-wise, between the first half and the second half, 
and the 4141 and the more traditional 442. Um, I don't know that I saw too much of a difference there. Um, I, I do think it's curious, though, that, that Spencer went with a... The four one four one or a four five one, whatever you want to call it, essentially having that lone striker up there, particularly when it was Perlaza. He's Spencer himself has said before that he's not a huge fan of having a lone striker, and he has specifically outlined in the past why Perlaza isn't, isn't good <laughs> as, yeah. that, as that lone guy, and yet we show up and that's the way it is. So I'm not sure exactly w- why that was the lineup and Perlaza was that player. I I suppose that you could make the argument that Spencer was looking at that back line and thinking, you know, we've got three guys back there that this is new for. Let's go with something where we can put Marceline in there and have him back there to help a little bit. And maybe as the second half rolled around, he thought, you know, those four guys in the back line are holding their own. They're playing pretty well. Let's go ahead and, and change it up and move to a 4-4-2 then. But there was some confusion in that as well because, and I tweeted out at one point, I, I was wondering who was playing left outside mid because I don't think anybody was. Because for a while, it was all Hassan that was pushed up front with Perlaza. And Spencer said that in the post-game press conference. And I think it was supposed to be Chara who went out wide and to leave Jewsbury and Marceline in the yeah, middle, Alexander on the right. But it was a huge gaping hole. I don't know if there was some miscommunication or if, if Chara just was sinking inside because he wanted to. But for a long, a good long while, there was a massive gaping hole out there. And I think those were some times when you could tell just how hard Chabala has to work to get his speed. I, yeah. I'm not sure that I would say that he's, he's not fast, but if he wants to be as fast as possible, if he wants to get up to some of that same speed as the other players around him, he has to work really hard at it. And, and yeah. that's when it became apparent to me. And, and things sort, once they made some substitutions, things got sorted out a little bit. But there was definitely some confusion there, I think, at, at the beginning of that second half when Al Hassan went up front in the 4 4 2 and there was some, some gaping holes out there out wide left. And so then what kind of got me angry <laughs> at the Timbers was. When they went to the four four two after what you're describing w- sort of passed and they got it figured out and and Chara was on the left and Al Hassan was on the right and Nagby was up front first mm-hmm. with Perlaza and then when Perlaza went out with DK mm-hmm. there was Shea Salinas looked like the world's greatest soccer player for about a five minute period he just dribbled the ball at will all over the middle of the field. There was no one, nobody at all preventing him from doing anything. And they, they almost scored on a couple of occasions going down towards the North end with Shea Salinas, just dr- literally dribbling 30 and 40 yards down the middle of the park with nobody there. And, and I think part of that is that with, when Chirag goes out of the middle, Jewsbury's natural inclination is to drop deeper. Marceline is permanently deeper and there was nobody else there. So Chara was out wide where I thought he was utterly ineffective uh, mm-hmm. and a complete waste of the talents that he has. And I don't think he'll ever play there. I think it was just a matter of circumstance in this, in this preseason game. I don't think people need to worry that, that they were experimenting with him on the left. I just think you can't put Marceline or Jewsbury out wide. So Chara's the next best option with, with the guys on the field. But there were, it, was, it was just a huge gap between the four the sort of outside midfielders and forwards and then the four back line and, and the two central midfielders when they did that switch. And that was one of the, the main problems with the Timbers last year. They never, ever had anyone in the middle of the field. Um, and, and when Chara, you know, was at his best was when he was in the middle ahead of Jewsbury and Jewsbury was basically permanently parked behind. We, we sort of saw that in the second half of the season last year. And, you know, 
again, I know that it was a matter of circumstance who is available um, and how much they don't you know want to tire guys out because they do have games again on Thursday and Sunday. But that was a to me a disaster, and it, it seemed you know the con- I didn't understand why they combined. Perlaza and Nagby as forwards. I thought that didn't really generate anything. I, I thought when DK came in, that gave a little more balance to the types of players who were playing forward. You know, the difference between Nagby and DK is such that they do different things, and and um, and I thought that was a little more productive. But it it's still, yeah. I don't. You, you go ahead and say what you what you're about to say, and then I I want to say something about DK after that. Well, I think. I think some of those things that you talked about perhaps could be combined and, and sort of go together to create that confusion with Marceline and Jewsbury both sort of sinking back. I think maybe that's what led to Chara sort of drifting being inward, confused yeah. and, and drifting in and not sure what was going on. And it, it basically seemed as though it, it was just there was just some confusion about you know a mid-game switch, and maybe there shouldn't have been. We've seen that before last season with the same players involved, but maybe it was just the circumstances of this game, and maybe that's what they needed to go through for Spencer to point out, you know, when we make this switch or we make a change like this mid-game, this is how these responsibilities change, yada, yada, yada. It just seemed like it came down to some confusion about who was, is supposed to be doing what exactly. And they did make a couple of changes. And so guys moved, as you mentioned, Khalif went forward, then he went back out wide. Chara yep. was in the middle, then he went out wide. Then, you know, Nagby was, you know, in and out. And, it, you know, it is, it's, of course, important to remember, it is preseason. Obviously, we'd like, you know, the season starts in less than two weeks. So we'd like to see it a little sharper, but that that's part of the point of these games. It, it's yeah. not to, to display how great you are. It's to work out some of the kinks, to put guys in situations that maybe they're not comfortable with that, in, with, with sort of the end game in mind being, they have to experience this kind of change or this kind of shift at some point. Let's do it when it doesn't matter at all what the result is. I mean, we all like to see wins, but, you know, the Timbers were undefeated in the preseason last year. They're undefeated in the preseason this year. I don't think anybody thinks they're the best team in the league. It, it you know, so it it doesn't really matter what the final score is on some level. Uh, you know, giving those guys the different combinations and the different responsibilities and the responsibility of knowing what their responsibilities are uh, is is an important part of the preseason. Uh, let me just say this about DK. And I, I think he's a great guy, and I think he plays really hard. I just don't think he's up to it. I, I, I just don't think he's good enough to play with the kinds of guys who are around him in this team uh, who are highly skilled. Uh, I think he could be a good MLS forward in a, in a different system. But when – I don't know. I, I just don't th- – I think he's a good counter, I think, to, to some of the, the sort of speed and technicality of some of the other players, and it, it can sort of catch defenders off guard. But when Chris Boyd comes in, he's going to be the starting forward. And I, I can't see a scenario where Bright DK is playing alongside Chris Boyd for more than a couple of minutes because it doesn't seem to offer very much uh, variety. And I just don't, I don't think DK's touch is good enough to, to accept the kind of passes that he's getting from the wings, for whether it be Nagby or, or Al Hassan. And it, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to be overly negative, but I just, I sort of saw it the other night against Oregon State. Obviously, he was sort of bigger and stronger than all of those guys and didn't have any problems. But, you know, he, he does have kind of a knack once he gets around goal. But w- when he's trying to get the ball like at the edge of the box, you know, his, you know, he tries to play it off his chest and it bounces, you know, five or six yards away. He tries to, you know, corral a pass and it sort of bounces off his foot wildly. And I think in the second division, he could kind of make up for that by sort of bullying the other player to get back to the ball. And occasionally he still does that. And, and I think, you know, having a good work rate is important <clears throat> and, will, and will earn you playing time, especially with a, a coach like John Spencer, who, who values that. But in the long run, you know, I, I just don't think he is the right kind of player to take advantage of, of, you know, like Khalif is going to do a bunch of fancy moves every time he gets the ball. And then he's going to send a pass that either comes out of nowhere or is very pinpointed. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we hope 
becoming closer and closer to the target as time goes on. You need somebody who can accept that pass and turn and do something with it immediately and not need, you know, an extra second or two to sort of gain possession. And and, and I think, you know, that's difficult to swallow and on some level, but on the other hand, you know, he sort of should be further down the list. I mean, he should be below Boyd and Perlaza and Nagby. And I think I think by the time the season's over, I think he will very clearly be the fourth option at that position. Well, and I think we we need to remember that that we're looking at DK now and and, and really looking at him the way we should have a year ago this time. And and we've sort of put this off for a year, but I think last year coming into the season, those were the questions that people were interested in seeing. I, I think people were hopeful that, that DK could play at that level. They're intrigued at the potential and the possibility and, and the physicality that he brings, but it, he's got to play games to see if it will work to see if he's got enough other skills to, like you said, combine with his teammates and get the job done. And we're just, we've just been, you know, one year removed from getting to see if it, it will come to fruition. A couple of things bef- that I want to put in here. Um, we, we've got on the list to talk about Khalif's, Khalif's goal. We'll get some thoughts on that in a second. But there's a couple of questions. We got a a Twitter question from Joshua Roberts. Why do I never see interviews uh, or quotes from Khalif? Which is a very astute observation, and that's because Khalif never talks to the media. And everybody, I think, was hoping that he would last night. And he ducked into the locker room, and about 60 seconds later, he was gone. I have asked to talk to Khalif a number of times after various training sessions, and the answer always comes back the same. He's not interested. I think, I, I think you can count on one hand the number of times we've seen a quote from, from Khalif anywhere in the media. And two or three of those, I think, came from 2010 when he was there- first signed. There was a video of him when he lost the penalty kick competition last year and had to grow the mustache. And it was like two seconds long. And he was like, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to grow a mustache. And that, that was the only time I can remember seeing him on camera speaking. Yeah. Just he, he, he never does it. And, you know, the Timbers are pretty, they're pretty good about, about letting the media speak to players. But for the most part, they, they pretty much leave it up to the individual players. We can, whether it's after a training or after a game, you know, we can ask and, and say, hey, I, I'd like to talk to this person or that person. And most of the time, they will go and ask, and most players are more than agreeable. Every once in a while, they say, "You know, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot lately. I'm not up to it today. Maybe tomorrow, or they're busy for whatever reason." But just about everybody's pretty agreeable. But Khalif just always refuses. <laughs> so I, to be honest with you, I sort of would have hoped that last night after the game the Timbers media people would have impressed upon him the, the need to, yeah. Of, hey, just give him five minutes. Like, I mean, you know, even telling Khalif, you know, we give you pretty much full reign. We don't pressure you to, to do anything you want to do, but this might be the one time we're going to kindly ask you to go yeah. meet with the media. You scored the only goal in the first time anybody's seen the team in 2012. Yeah. He's the guy that should be, I mean, in any other circumstance, uh, and it's, it's not a criticism of him. It's just everybody else, if, if it was Footy who scored a header, because um, I'm trying to think, you know, guys who maybe the English isn't their favorite thing to do uh, or, or that, that they don't feel like maybe they, they sound particularly articulate when they speak English. I, I completely understand that. Um, and there are several guys on the team, uh, I'm not even talking about the, the guys who you know, aren't really fluent in English necessarily, but, you know, guys like Footy and James and, and Khalif, where, where English is not necessarily their, their, their forte, it doesn't mean that they can't communicate. And Footy is 
always happy to to speak with anybody about anything and you know always basically unless it's after a loss does it with a smile on his face and is perfectly communicable and so you know I, that to me is it's a little disappointing that Khalif doesn't you know at least go out there and try to give it a go he's also like 21 and, or 20 or whatever he, I mean he's he's young and and I can understand being uncomfortable with with that kind of thing too so yeah that that is a good question and um yeah he's he's one guy in the locker room you 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 don't see him he's not there he's either in the shower hiding or gone uh, yeah. already uh, all the time and uh, it's I, it's a, yeah it's weird yeah and i i just would have you know I, I would think in those circumstances, you know, the Timbers front office media people would say, you know, look, given the history and, and what the goal that you just scored, Khalif, you, you kind of need to go do this. The word I got as I was leaving, though, was that uh, they would try and wrangle him for after practice today, which I mean, I guess that's fine and good. But, you know, there are a lot of people who were a lot of media types who were there at the game that aren't there today necessarily going to go back to practice. Yeah. I mean, I think he should have been made available after the game in those circumstances. And yeah, I mean, again, you got to look at the whole history of it and, and sort of his, you know, not speaking to the media and maybe, you know, shoving him along a little bit in that one instance and saying, yeah, especially because it was a positive. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be people asking him. Exactly. I mean, mean, maybe somebody would have asked, you've tried that shot 1.25 million times, as John Spencer said, you know, but it, but it would have been in good spirits. You know, it would have been, aren't, you know, aren't, how happy are you to have scored this goal? and, And what does it mean to finally get one and to do it in front of the Timbers army? And I mean, it would have been all positive questions, with with positive answers, so uh, well let, let's mention the goal really quickly. I mean, I think most people have seen it. Um, th- there are a couple of good angles for it, uh, particularly if you can see Allison Andrews's photos. She's standing right behind him. Uh, Sean Levy put together a nice little GIF, uh, just kind of cycling through Allison's shots of of the shot going in. And you can for anybody who thinks it was a cross. Look at that GIF, and and you will be uh, corrected in in thinking that it was a cross. It was most definitely a shot. Uh, when you see it from that angle, you can see that he's clearly aiming for that top right corner. Where, you know, if if you've ever watched Khalif in practice or in a game, you know that that's his shot. He's that's a- what he, was- he always aims for the top right corner. Now that he made it from the most acute angle, I think I've seen him try it. Is the is probably the funniest thing about the goal because usually he's in a position where it's a less difficult shot uh, to make than than from where he took that one last night. But it's a great goal, uh, a good thing to get the Timbers kick started. Uh, great to have it happen in front of the North End. Um, I don't know that it means he'll score goals in this during the season, but it's certainly um, a, a good thing. Actually, this is this is kind of funny. I. Uh, I spoke to the AIK coach after the game last night, and, and he had told me at practice the other day they'd had five previous preseason games, and, and none of their forwards had scored any goals. And that was a, you know, a little bit of a concern. I mean, they'd had midfielder score and whatever. And so I asked him if he was happy about that, that the score forward, a forward scored in the game, uh, in the first game. And he said, well, yeah, but, but basically he's most happy because what guys do is when they go to bed, they basically count how many goals they had that day. And it was just kind of a funny way of saying, like, when you're missing shots over and over again, that's all you can think about. And if you're if you get one to go in, I mean, it is a lot of a mental thing, you know, just just f- having that feeling that I've I've not just done this in practice. I I can do this in the game, and I have done it, and it se- it seems to make it more likely that it'll happen again. So I think that's a good maybe way to put it that that. It's nothing but good for Khalif to get a goal, even if it's in the preseason, because it, you know, the flip side is it may make it even more likely that he tries shots like that. <laughs> um, maybe without positive results, I don't know, but uh, definitely was happy to see him to finally get one and to get one in the way that he's always trying. Yeah, it's boy, there's good and bad. I mean, everybody's happy that he scored and got one, but. 
he, I mean, he almost seems incapable of, of, of hitting like a bright DK type shot, just putting his laces straight through the ball and driving it into, into the back of the net. If, if you've spent any time watching him at training at all, you know that it's not just he's trying to be fancy once in a while and score a great goal once in a while. It's every single that time he's on the ball. does is, is put all kinds yeah. of English on the ball and try to curve it and bend it into those upper corners. And even when he, even when he shoots it on the ground, it's usually got some bend on it. He's trying to finesse it into a, into a corner. And I, I don't know. I mean, it's great that he scored, but boy, now that he's scored on one of those, <laughs> it's just going to continue the streak. I, I don't know. Well, let's um, let's quickly just mention Chivas uh, because that is the game coming up on Thursday. And well, let, let's I, why don't we just give a grade overall of what what we thought of the game last night? Uh, I'll go first. I, I thought it was a B. I thought it was fine. I thought I think if you take into account the circumstances of who was playing uh, and and why certain guys were playing and then why guys like Nagby and Palmer only you know played sparingly. Uh, I thought that the team that was out there did reasonably well against what was, for the most part, a regular starting 11 for San Jose. I mean, their best players were on the field. I mean, the Chavez, the new, you know, they brought him in on the trade, Wondolowski, Linhart, Betasher, Corrales, uh, Bernandez was a new signing, you know, their starting keeper, Bush. I mean, they had uh, Cronin. Uh, guys who play all the time for them were in that lineup much well, not maybe not much more so, but but certainly as much as as some of the Timbers guys outside of the back line. So I, I think that the the way the Timbers performed was was okay. And considering the results from last year, you know, in ninety minutes in three games, they were all even with San Jose. So maybe that's um, I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but I think. They didn't do significantly worse than expected on the whole, and they certainly didn't do significantly better than expected, and so I thought it was a B. Um, I, I thought it was a pretty average performance. I think when you do consider, which you need to consider, the players that were gone and the guys who were in, um, despite some of the confusion that was there, I think I'd probably settle on, on maybe a B-. minus. Um, but it was, I think it was definitely better than average. Uh, so I'd, I'd probably settle on a, on a, on a B minus. Well, quickly, just about Chivas, they, they did play AIK, uh, uh, whom the Timbers will play Sunday. Uh, AIK are, are a pretty good team, uh, although qu quite young and Chivas did not look particularly great in that game. I, I thought AIK did some nice things. Uh, they kind of took Chivas away from what they want to do, which is what their their man AIK's manager referred to as their short passing game, uh, and that's something they definitely want to do. They've got some really quick uh, and some extremely fast players. Uh, Miller Bolaños in particular was was quite good. Ryan Smith, um, uh, Lahoud, uh, I think it's Michael Lahoud. Those guys were all good. They they all were 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 very quick, very fast, move the ball uh, on the ground. And that's something I think the Timbers are going to need to look out for. Uh, we know about Juan Pablo Angel. We know about Alejandro Moreno. Those guys aren't fast. Uh, you know, th their game is pretty well known. Um, they're both good, uh, but you're not going to be surprised by what Juan Pablo Angel does against you. He may beat you, but it's not going to be in a way that you're unfamiliar. So th those are sort of the guys to, to key on. Another thing, they took Juan Pablo Angel out. Now, in fairness, they were already down 2-0, so they were chasing the game a little bit. But they put in a, a guy named Cesar Romero, who I, I think is a new signing this year as well. Uh, they've had a lot of turnover, actually, at Chivas this year. And he was quite good. Uh, he, uh, They didn't score in the game, but he was able to create a lot of chances against what was sort of a, a rapidly tiring AIK back line. So that's something to look out for, too, is late in the game. Uh, you know, they've got some guys who are younger or, or sort of new to the team that the Timbers aren't going to be very familiar with, uh, who they can put in and, and may do a little bit of damage. Uh, but they really didn't trouble AIK all that much. 
I mean, if it was up to me, and and I, you know, obviously it isn't, and there's there's more to take into account than just this one game. But I I would be very happy to see James Marceline in the lineup again, simply because of the threat of these guys cutting and darting and moving. I think it would be very useful to have a player like James sitting in front of the back line of whatever pairing it ends up being. Uh, I think it's possible we could again see. Mascara and Jean Baptiste because I, you know, Footy I don't think is going to be back, and Bruner I don't get the sense is going to be. I don't think they're going to be rushing him to get back for a preseason game on a Thursday. So we may see that same back line, and and that that is uh, unlike San Jose, which has very big uh, and, and sort of um, more physical players. You know, Angel is is not small, but he's also he's you know he's crafty, and with some of these other guys buzzing about, that that is definitely something to, to keep an eye on. But I think the Timbers can score against Chivas. Kennedy is a good goalkeeper, but I think they can score. So that's that's my little preview for Thursday, and we'll see what lineup goes out there. Uh, that that I assume we'll see some differences. Uh, you know, I think we'll see Nagby start. I think we'll see Palmer start, and we may get to see guys like Taylor. And Rankin and Rincon, whereas we didn't see them at all last night. Yeah, I caught about the last twenty minutes of of that match before the Timbers match. That was their best twenty minutes, by the way, Chivas. Yeah, yeah. and and so I was I was going to say I, it was tough to tell at that point. Aik was up two nil. It's the last fifteen or twenty minutes, so I I wasn't sure if I was seeing some really good Chivas stuff or maybe just. AIK trying to, to finish this thing out. But but I, I definitely did notice uh, some pretty good ball movement from Chivas on the ground up in that in that final third. And, and they tested the, the keeper a couple of times yep. uh, in there. Um, so, uh, yeah, not too sure if that was more due to AIK, you know, at the end of the game or, or a compliment to Chivas. But um, certainly uh, should give us Thursday night, uh, uh, another good chance to hopefully see some some of these same guys, but maybe a few other ones, like you mentioned. Yeah, and it, it, it's going to be a different test than than was San Jose, a much less physical team uh, in Chivas, and much quicker on the on the ground, move the ball, especially without a guy like you know they lost Justin Braun uh, in the off season, who was a big, tall forward. Um, you know they've got a they've got James Riley in the team now uh, as an outside back. Again, I don't know who they're going to play. Either, but he played the the whole game. I think uh, as an outside back, we're familiar with him, of course, from Seattle. Uh, so they they've got some good, interesting pieces, and they're a team that's still coming together. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Timbers win because I think Chivas are still. I think they're further behind in their preseason preparations because they have so much turnover and because they're still bringing guys in, uh, whereas the Timbers are a little better off in that regard. But. Uh, yeah, well, we're up against the the time here. Um, I guess we can mention that Merritt Paulson's been pretty quiet on Twitter uh, after the Ticketmaster thing the other day, uh, last week. Uh, he's been pretty quiet until last night. He seemed pretty happy with the turnout um, yeah. and and excited to to get you know a, a group of people into the stadium, you know, as opposed to last Thursday night's scrimmage where it was just a couple of us you know shivering in the press box. So. Uh, yeah, uh, nothing too much, nothing too, certainly nothing interesting to report, uh, on the Merritt Paulson Twitter update. Yeah. And I, and I don't know how much of the, uh, the Ticketmaster fiasco fed his, his Twitter silence there for a few <laughs> days, but I, I don't suppose we need to get into that and rehash everybody's Ticketmaster complaints. No, I don't think so. Oh, we should mention actually, Trevor asked that we mention this, uh, the, I think, Single game tickets go on sale for the Timbers today, starting at five o'clock. So if you're listening live and or if you're able to get the audio podcast out later today, uh, five p.m. Pacific, I'm pretty sure uh, is is the time that you can go. I think people are already in line, so you may want to get on that if you if you don't have season tickets. Uh, last year, the the games, you know, the big games, L.A., Seattle, Vancouver, those went up right away. Uh, and Trevor also wants us to mention Portlandia. Uh, that came out on Friday, the the one about the Timbers Army, um, which I was uh, disappointed in that skit. It wasn't it wasn't that great, and I, I really hope that nobody tries to start up any of these kinds of please please win uh, meow chants. 
um, it was not it was not one of the be- the best Portlandia skits, uh, and continued the run of being thirty to forty five seconds too long, uh, just like every Portlandia skit is, uh, regardless of subject matter. Uh, w- Trevor's actually going to be gone uh, for the next couple weeks, so we're going to be audio only. In terms of podcasts, we're still trying to work out if we'll be able to be uh, live video or not. But don't worry, we'll be back. Uh, uh, we'll be back on Tuesday, and we will be previewing the Philadelphia Union match, and we'll of course review the the previous matches um, uh, from Chivas and, and AIK uh, leading up to that. We'll preview the Union. We'll hopefully have a guest uh, in order to help better facilitate that. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the tournament, and I uh, hope everybody turns out for the games both on Thursday and Sunday. And uh, yeah, over the next week, have a good one. Uh, this is Mal. And this is Kelly. We'll see you next week. Yep. Speak to you then.